If your God is great this morning, give him a praise. Come on, really give him a praise. You just can't praise God enough. You can't praise God enough for all that he is. I'm going to go this morning to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I want to begin reading in verse 25. I'm going to read a familiar story to you and share with you from these verses here this morning. I, I appreciate the word of God. I love the scripture. I love to look at the word of God. See what it's saying to us. What is it talking to us? We've got to come into the perspective of God's Word. It's all about the Word of God. It's not about anything else. It is the Word of God that makes us complete. We are complete in Him. He is the Word made flesh. He is the Word incarnate. We are complete in Him. You can't be complete without the fulfilling of the Word of God into your life. It's got to speak. It's got to be alive. It's got to be real. And it's not just a word that you read off of a page. It is called a living word. And it is a life lifeline unto us. I'm going to read this morning, beginning verse 25, a familiar story about the Good Samaritan. And I want to see what this verse is saying to us here this morning. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempting him, and saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What is necessary for me? What must I do? He, he is tempting the Lord. He is not serious. He is not sincere. But this subject of what must I do to inherit eternal life is a, is a prominent question of concern to every one of us today. It is, it is of concern to each one of us. You remember in Acts 2, the very birthday of the church, that was a question that came up after they heard the first New Testament message preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost, they said, what must we do? What do we have to do to inherit that? So uh, no matter how insincere this lawyer was when he approaches Jesus, his question is good. See, if we end up lost without God, it will not be because God rejected us, it will be because we have rejected him. The Bible said the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. So there's not a person that walks, comes into this world that in some way God does not have a way to deal with their life. Now, it may be different in a different, maybe they're in a different part of the world, maybe they're in an Africa that is uncivilized, or, and, but God has a way of dealing with every person's life. Then in verse 26, And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Now, when Jesus is asked by the lawyer, he recognizes that the lawyer's attempt is fraudulent, that it is not true, that it is not a real effort to find out about eternal life at all. And so Jesus immediately takes the lawyer to the word of God. And he says, how are you reading the scripture? How are you reading the word of God? How is it, uh, it is written in the law. If you want eternal life, it's in the book. So Jesus is saying, if you're interested, any person, any, anywhere in the entire world, if you are interested in eternal life, look into the law of God. It has the answer. It has the prescription for your salvation. It has the answer for your life. So the question is, how do you read the scripture? Are you looking at the scripture from an argumental standpoint, which some people do? There are those that are constantly studying the scripture. I once knew a man, no longer is he living, and he was always studying the scripture, but not interested in living right himself, but always to try to argue something and to try to come up with an argument against the word of God. How do you read the scripture? Do you read the scripture to try to find flaws that are in it? Because you're not going to find that. Presumed flaws are in our mentality, but not in God's. It is a perfect story written on perfect, uh, it is a perfect rule that we are to go by. How do we read the scripture? Do we read them believing that they are absolute truth? 
Now, that's going to be the outcome or the sum of the matter in how it is determined to you. It is how do you read the Word of God? How do you view the Scripture? The Word of God is the only thing that can give you eternal life. So in verse 27, the lawyer replied, and he said, you should love the Lord your God. Now, when we talk about lawyers, we are talking about lawyers of the Word of God. Law, we're talking about the Pharisee. We're talking about those that are schooled in the law of God. Today, they're in courts of law, but in biblical times, and even now, if you go to court, your court is based on the teaching of the Scripture. Most of the law that we have today is based on the Word of God. That's where the law came from. And so <clears throat> when the lawyer heard him say, search the Scripture, How do you, what are you going to find in the Scripture? What does the Bible have to say? The lawyer said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered right. You've answered it right. Do this and you shall live. Now I'm here this morning and the question is being given to you as well as it was presented to Jesus by the lawyer. There are four phases of our, of our dedication and our commitment unto God. Number one, we've got to worship him with all of our heart. That is our inner being. We have a body that we live in, but we have our real life in the inner being. That's why the, 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 the Paul wrote and he said, though the outward man perisheth. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, he said the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewing day by day. The signs of aging is upon a lot of us. The evidence that we're not getting younger is very easy to see. But the fact is that while the outer man is perishing, the inner man is growing stronger and stronger and stronger by the day as we walk with God. Then in our soul, he said, we've got to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul. When God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam and Eve, or of Adam, he became a living soul. That soul juvenated life into him. It gave him feelings. It gave him a mind. It gave him uh, all of the senses of, of, of our natural being. They all came to life in the soul of that person. And so he says unto us that all of your natural abilities, whether it be feel, touch, whether it be hearing or smell, or whether it be by speech or whatever we have, we are to love God with that and we're to express our love to God in those kind of ways. Our love for God comes out of our mouth. Our love for God should go into our ear. Our love for God should be in our feelings and our emotions. Everything that we have should show our love for God. And then he said, all of your strength, all of your strength should be given to the love of God. Now we give our strength to a lot of things today and we give very little attention to the work of God. We give very little attention to our daily life, our daily walk, our daily dedication to God. But the Bible said in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, strengthen your hands for a good work. Everything that we do is not good. But he said, strengthen your hand for good work. There should be good things coming out of our life. So the Bible said in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, whatever your hands find to do, do that with all your might. Sometime or another, we should find some capacity in our life that we will find something for God that we love to do and wish to do that we could do with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. In our mind, it is talking about our capacity to think. In our capacity, our mentality, in our capacity to think, we should love God with that capacity that we have. Love God, dedicate to God. The Bible said in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity the thought into the obedience of Christ. Now when he is saying every thought should be brought into captivity, brought into the bondage of the, of the obedience of Christ, he is talking about thoughts of disobedience, thoughts that would lead you away from God. 
Thoughts that would distract you in your daily walk with God. And there are things that will come into our life. There are situations that will come into our life. But he is saying that if we love God, we're going to dedicate our mind to hearing and knowing about the good things of God. Then in verse 29, he said, but he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So that lawgiver, that lawman, that lawyer could not, could not just face the fact of the word that he is hearing, but is trying to justify himself that I'm good enough to have eternal life. Well, let me tell you something this morning. There is not one of us in this building that is good enough to deserve eternal life. And there is none of us that's going to have eternal life unless we have received it by obedience to the word of God. Not because we earned it, not because we deserved it. So with that, Jesus began to tell a story. Jesus said, Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment. They wounded him, and he departed, and they departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, there came a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, he said, a Levite, when he, was, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he, so, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now remember, this good Samaritan, Jesus is telling his own story. He is talking about himself. And I want to preach to you about that here just a few minutes this morning. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own animal, his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on tomorrow, when he departed, he took uh, his two pence, two pennies, and gave it to the host and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever you spend more than this, he said, when I come again, I will repay. I'll pay the debt that is owed. Just keep it, and I'll take care of it. Which now, uh, which now of those three do you think was a neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? He is asking, was it the Levite? Was it the priest? Or was it the good Samaritan? And he said, and he said, uh, he that showed him the mercy. The lawyer said, him that showed him the mercy. And then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Let me step into this story just a moment with you here this morning. Because unfortunately, many of us sometimes, even Christians, find themselves walking in the wrong direction. They find themselves leaning to things that they should not be leaning to, leaning over, giving over to things that they should not be giving over to. And the Bible said in verse 30 that this man went down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now think about that. He is traveling the wrong direction. He has actually left the city of Jerusalem, which is called the city of peace, a place where peace abounded, and he is headed down to the city of Jericho, which Jericho means the city of, of curse. So he is leaving the presence of God, leaving the presence of the peace of God. And there are times that we find ourselves in that same kind of a position. This is talking about a man that is falling, falling away from the right thing toward the wrong thing. It is talking about a man who is falling into de de degeneration. And he is in a degenerate lifestyle, falling further and further away from God. But as he walks along in the state of his backsliding, he is perfectly comfortable until the enemy gets him where he wants, and then the enemy attacks him. I want to tell you something about departing from God. As we depart from God, it, doesn't, it never looks bad where we're going. It always looks okay. The challenge looks all right. The journey appears to be okay. And step by step, we find ourselves walking away from the peace of God toward the curse that God will place upon us. 
And when the enemy tries to make the world look so good to you, he forgets to tell you that before you ever get to where you're going, he's going to come and prey upon you. He is going to come and destroy you and do everything he can to break you down totally that you'll never find your way back to the peace of God. I know that a lot of people think that once you've known God, everything's okay. But friend, that's not the story of God at all. That's not the word of God. I hear God say, I'll come and remove your candlestick completely out of its place. I hear God say to us on many times that we can, we can fall from the grace of God and the favor of God is no longer with us. He went down traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, falling, condescending, descending down from the city of peace to the city of curse. And it can happen so easily whenever we fail to study the word of God. There were times in our life when we first came to God that study was easy for us. We wanted to study the word of God. Many of us, maybe we bought tape recordings of, of the word of God being read and we would listen to that and, and, and it would read to us over and over and over the word of God. Many of you today have that in your phones and you have that in your iPads that you could go to the Bible and you could just turn that on and it'll read to you all day long if you want the word of God. And it's there. All you've got to do is use it. The feature is there. You don't have to go to a bookstore and buy it anymore. It's right there. But when we begin to fail in our study of the word of God, we begin to go down. When we begin to lose our love for the learning of the word of God, we begin to go down. When we begin to let up in our prayer life, until we are not praying and we are not seeking God the way that we should. We are not inviting the presence of God to come into our life. He is not a daily communicating force into our life. We are beginning to find out that the curse of God is closer to us than the blessing of God. And we need to return back to the presence of Jesus Christ. When we begin to fail in praise when we can't praise God, when we don't have the courage to walk into the house of God or the strength of the effort to lift our hands and to praise and to worship God. Listen, there was a time I didn't even have to have music to praise God. I could do it with it or without it. I loved him. I just wanted to praise him. I couldn't praise him enough. But what's happened today? Well, I've learned more about how to live for God. I'm going to tell you, if you learn more about how to live for God, you're going to learn if there's anything God loves, he loves hearing you compliment him. He loves your praise. He loves true worship. And God wants you to praise him every day of your life. I should have moments of praise, times of worship, times of devotion that I could give God the dedication of my life. Here's a man living in the city of blessing, the city of peace, the city where things are going good, the, things, the city where things are not bad at all. And inside the city of peace, he decides, I'm going to descend down to the city of Jerusalem. Not long into his journey, he fell among thieves, the Bible said. They beat him and they stripped him and they left him half dead. And there he was on that road. You see, this is what Satan wants to do to you every day of your life. He wants to strip you. He wants to, he wants to embarrass you. He wants to humiliate you. He wants to leave you half dead and, and without any uh, hope of recovering in life. The enemy hates you. You are a child of God. The enemy doesn't love you at all. He will try everything he can to destroy you and to destroy your life. This is what Satan attempts to do. This is what his job is. This is what he does. Satan attempts to strip every man of his salvation. He doesn't want you to be uh, able to call on the name of the Lord and healing come to bodies. The Bible said, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you are to depart from iniquity. You are to walk away from sin. Walk away from wrong things. Walk away, away from things that bring curses to your life. When you begin to declare the name of the Lord, the, the blessing of God, the blessings of God, the blessings of God will come upon your life. But when you begin to fall away, Satan will begin to rob you. He robs you of fellowship with God and he breaks down your self-respect. He breaks down that self-respect and integrity that you have. 
until you don't feel like I'm worthy of the blessing of God anymore. I'm not worthy of coming into the blessings of God. Let me tell you this morning, you're only repentance away from finding Jerusalem again. No matter how, how far along you are in the death penalty of the thieves, no matter how far you are down the road of, de, of de, de, degrade and, and, and digression, it doesn't make any difference. The love of God says to you, I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son that if you would just simply believe in me, you could have eternal life. Give him praise here this morning, will you? <clears throat> See, when we begin to lose our self-respect, we begin to lose our self-integrity, we become like the prodigal son. It is easy to get there. It is easy to fall away from God and not even realize it's happening. Step by step. I've been in this for a long time, and I've watched many, many a people that have come and gone from the house of God. And unfortunately, because you came, and because you prayed, and because you turned your life over to God, doesn't mean that you're going to heaven at the end of this journey. There are people that most people in the world today just believe that just because you're alive, and just because you're existing, that automatically God's going to take you to heaven. But friend, Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. Now, this is back to what Jesus said. How do you read the word of God? How do you study the word of God? The prodigal came to himself, but not till he was in a hog pen. There was nothing more degrading to a Jewish boy than to have to tend to the hogs. But he ended up in the hog lot, in the mud, the mire, and the muck. I remember back when I was a little boy, we had a neighbor that had a little farm and he had a pony. And I loved to ride that pony. But in order to get to the pony, I had to cross the hog lot. The pony would get in the barn and I'd have to cross the hog lot. And when you'd step in where the hogs had been, they were knee deep in mud. I don't know, it could be a dry summer, but it was a knee deep in mud where the hogs were. It just stayed that way. But you know what? I wanted to ride that pony bad enough that I would take my shoes off and I would walk through that mud almost knee deep to get there. Did I enjoy it? No, I didn't because I knew what that mud was mixed with. But I wanted to ride that pony. We get like a prodigal son. We get in a hog lot. And when we get down in the hog lot, that's not where everybody wants to be. That's where the mud is. That's where the stink is. That's where things are not good. But we have decided that we, want, we don't mind to go to the mud and to the muck just to get what we're looking for. Let me tell you this morning. This young man that we call the prodigal son, he did not come to himself whenever he was in trouble. He did not come to himself until he was in the hog lot. And when he got in the hog lot, he said, my brethren at home have plenty to eat. And my father's got a nice home back there. And if I would just return, sometimes we don't understand what we've lost until the devil has robbed us of our family, until the devil has robbed us of our money. Our inheritance has become depleted. It's all blended, uh, washed away from us. Our inheritance is gone. Our bank account is stripped. We don't have the money to, to get up and, and to buy ourselves something to drink or to eat if we want. You know where we're at? We're in a hog lot. We're stuck down in the mud of the hog lot. And somehow, we've got to find a way to get out. And there's not a lot of ways to get out. You've got to wait it, and you've got to get out of it. Amen. This man that we call the, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. The fact is, we don't even know the guy's name that left Jerusalem. We don't know who he was. We don't know anything about him. We don't know whether he was a, a, a person of renownness or just a simple person in the community. We know absolutely nothing about him. We just know that one day he decided to leave the city of God and go to the city of a curse. Friend, I've been in this for several years, as I've said, but I've never found a place that I really wanted to go back. I found plenty of places I could go back, but not plenty of places where I wanted to go back. 
I've never seen anything in the world that compares to what I find in the church. The world offers me sorrow, and the church offers me peace. The world offers me sickness, and God offers me healing. God offers me everything that the world can't give. The world can't give it, and the world can't take it away. I'm so glad for that. Give him praise in the house here this morning. He finds himself on the road, beaten down, robbed of everything that he's got. All of his pride is gone, and there he is laying, half dead on the road. That means he's only half alive. He just ready. He could go either way. He's half in. He's half out. And by by chance, Jesus said, just by chance, there came a priest walking by his way. Well, you know, a good priest would at least stop and give you last rites, right? Well, this one didn't. He understood that in the nearby caverns or hid behind the rocks, these thieves are still in the area. And the same thief that got this man could get me. So the Bible said he walked around him a different way and went on on his way. Now let's look at this priest here just for a minute. The priest, the Bible said, was chosen by God. Chosen by God to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Oh, he'd go to the church and he'd offer his sacrifices and kill the animals and do all those things. But when it came a time to really offer help, he understood, I can't help this guy. He's too far gone. I want to tell you, there comes a time that the blood of goats and of bulls and all the sacrifices and all the things you can offer can't do you any good. You've got to turn your life over to Jesus. He's the only answer. There is no answer outside of him. The priest realized, I can't do anything for this guy except jeopardize myself. Nothing but the blood can set you free from sin. Nothing but the blood can deliver you from where you are into the message of hope and life. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that and do that for you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All the ceremonies of the priest could not bring him help. It would not do it. Then the Bible said when he passed by along comes a Levite. And the Levite is chosen by God again as the man of God that stands in the temple. And his job is two things. He offers prayer to God and he receives the tithe of the people. And so he passes by, and he looks at him, and he understands, I'm ordained of God to serve in the temple. And they were ordained to pray and to receive the tithe, but the Levite could not help him. See, there comes a time in your life, and there comes a moment in your life, that your need is bigger than what money can meet. No matter how much money you've got, no matter how much money you're, money you're handling, there comes a time that money can't meet your need. You've got to come with, with a commitment and dedication to God. And he understood, I am ordained of God to stand in the temple and pray, but I don't believe my little prayer can help this guy. He's too far along. There comes those moments that the priest and the Levite cannot help. But then there was a good Samaritan. Who he was, we're not told. What he was, we're not told. He apparently doesn't work in the temple because those who worked in the temple are identified. And he's an unidentifiable man. But he's called a good Samaritan. He is not good because he's prestigious, because the prestigiousness is never brought out. He's not important in the community. He doesn't have a particular title that is placed upon his name, like Levite Jones or Priestly Jones, nothing like that. He could probably be identified in the community as a nobody, as far as the world was concerned. But this man came to where the wounded man was. And what the priest and the Levite could not do for him, he was willing to do for him. And he did not consider even taking his own life at risk to spend the time to help this man. But he gave, the, he faced the chance of the, of, the, of the looters and robbers coming against him. And the good Samaritan came to where he was. That good Samaritan is talking about Jesus. It is talking about the man of Galilee. It is talking about the God of heaven. When the priest could not help and the law could not help because a perfect law met an imperfect man and they could never communicate together. There finally came a moment that all the laws that were given could not help. But God lift the portals of heaven 
came to the earth as a nobody, unaccepted by the world, rejected by the world, slain by his own, and was willing to go where we were to offer us salvation. Thank God for Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according to his divine power, according to his divine power, the Holy Ghost, the anointing of God, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. You know one of the things I like about that verse? The word knowledge in the Greek is kenosis. And most of the time, or almost every time that you read the word knowledge, it comes from the Greek word kenosis. But when I looked up the Greek word in this, it had a prefix, which was epikenosis. And epikenosis means this. It is just not a knowledge, but it is a special kind of knowledge. A special kind of knowledge. You see, it was through the special knowledge of God that he came to where I was. He didn't find me in the same hog pit he found you in. He found me in my own hog lot. He came to where I was. Jesus will go anywhere he needs to go. And he will reach for you anywhere he needs to reach for you and love you regardless of where you are because God loved you enough that if there had been nobody in the whole world that needed him but you, he would have died at Calvary just for you. Hallelujah. What a wonderful God we serve. Through his special knowledge, he knows where we are. He knows our need. He has a special knowledge of our need. He has a special knowledge of how to reach us. See, he reached me through a death. He reached you through some other means. He knows what, is, what will take place uh, in my life, in your life, after we are saved. The special knowledge of God can come and reach out to us. Salvation is a unique miracle from God. He finds us in different pits different places, different hog lots, but he finds us and comes to where we are. Hallelujah. Give him praise here this morning. See, the Lord is willing to go to different degrees of hell to reach each one of us. No wonder the psalmist says in Psalms 107 verse 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. I mean, it is not something that I have any trouble saying, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, I love you, I give you honor. The heart of God is touched with compassion when he sees fallen mankind. He is touched with compassion when he sees you where you are. He came to lift us out of our misery. He came to lift us out of our captivity. And the Bible said when he came to him, the first thing he did was bound up his wound. He bound up his wound. See, the Lord has a way of putting broken people back together again. There's people here in this building that you're broken this morning. There are things in your life that's creating pain and creating hurt. But the Lord knows how to put broken people back together again. And if we will come to God in godly sorrow... Biblical repentance, convicted by biblical standards, he will heal our broken heart and he will put us back together again. You say, are you sure of that? I know that because I know when God found me, he healed me of my brokenness and put me back together again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He will heal your broken heart. And the Bible said when he came to this man, he healed, he healed up, uh, put his wound back together and poured in oil and poured in wine. That was healing salves. And he poured that into him. And uh, then the Bible said that he took him to the inn. And he brought him into the inn, in, into what we might call a motel today. And he provided safety and shelter while the healing took place. Well, the Bible said that this good Samaritan couldn't stay there forever. He had to go away. You know, when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he went away. You know why he went away? Because he said, as long as I am with you, you'll never receive the power of salvation. 
But it is expedient for you that I go away. Necessary for you that I go away. And if I go away, that comforter is going to come to you and he's going to live on the inside of you. So when, when the good Samaritan went away, he left two pennies to cover two days for the innkeeper to take care of the person who was broken down, who was hurt. Today, it's my job. It's your responsibility. It's the responsibility of the church to provide protection for souls that have been restored back to God. The two pennies in the days of Christ represented two days' wages. It also, in two days' wages, the book of, of Psalms says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years the same as a day. What actually this story is telling me is this, that God took the man and put him into the innkeeper. And he said, I'm coming back. I'll be back in 2,000 years. And it's your job to protect him, to heal him, to nurture him, to bring him back together again. It's your job to bring healing to the body, the soul, and the spirit. Friend, today, the church is the innkeeper. We are the innkeepers, not the pastor. The church is the innkeeper. And the job of the church is to take the weak and the dying, to take those that are hurt and left that the world doesn't want. Amen. He left the church with the responsibility to nurture them that are half dead, that need to be brought back. He left the church to administer the healing oil and the job to feed them in the time of their weakness. You're not just here to receive you're not just here this morning to be the church and say, well, my job is to show up on Sunday. No, your job is to reach the world and to bring them to Jesus Christ and people that are in your world. You've got to do everything you can to try to help them to find Jesus. They're hurting, they're hurting, they're hurting. And when Jesus picks up those that are hurting and brings them unto the church, we are to bring resurrection hope into their life and give them hope of a life after this one and to nurture them. And when we see them falling away, we don't just say good riddance. We throw an arm around them and we try to hold them and we do everything we can to try to nurture them back to health and healing. You know why? Because the master, the good Samaritan, is coming back to the end and he's looking to see what we've done with the hurting man. Hallelujah. We're serving others. That's the job of the church. There's no position in the church for self-righteousness. There's no position in the church for self-centeredness. The Bible said, Paul wrote and said, I'm not my own. I have been bought with a price. I don't belong to myself. I am bought with a price. He left me two pennies. You know what that was? He made me the innkeeper. I'm the innkeeper. My job is to minister. My job is to protect. My job is, is to do what I can to help others. And job security in the New Testament comes by serving others in the kingdom of God. Can you give him praises as uh, come to the music? God is good this morning. He is so good. Hallelujah. If you want to know how much God loves you, it's not in the testimony. It's not in how you talk about God. It's not in what you write on Facebook. It's what you're doing for others. It's what you're doing for the kingdom of God. It's when God sees you on a Monday morning going and doing something for somebody. Not all for yourself, but willing to help others. What you're coming to the church to donate your time or your energies to the house of God. See, if you want to know how much God loves you, just count the hours that you're working for God every week. I'm the innkeeper. I'm not only the innkeeper, you're the innkeeper as well. And Jesus has brought the world to us, and it's our job to fix the mess that their lives are in. It's our job to try to minister health and healing and try to pick them up from the mess that they're in. If he brings us dope addicts, we're to love them. We're not to look down on them. We're not to make them feel they're less, lesser than us. We are to pick them up. If he brings us alcoholics, we are to do what we can to bring them and restore them from their alcohol indulgence. If God brings us a woman of ill repute, we're not to look down and say, thank God I'm not like her. 
We're to go down into the mud with her and to pick her up and to let her know you're somebody. You're real. You're important. You're a value. You're a value to God. You're invaluable to the work of God. If God sends us a homosexual or a lesbian, we've got to, be, we've got to treat them right. We can't look down on them. Now we look down on the sin. We're not for the sin, but we don't look down on the sinner. We've got to try to pick them up if any way possible. If he brings us a person dying with AIDS, what will be our response to them? Our response is we must pour in the oil, pour in the wine. God, we're going to pour out that blessing upon you. We're innkeepers. Our job may get nasty, but this is what God paid us to do. I'm not my own. He bought me off the slave market. I was a slave to sin, but now I've become a value to God. I've been bought with a price. He shed his innocent blood for me. He shed his innocent blood for you. God, right now across this building, men and women are sitting in this building, Christians and maybe non-Christians alike, some that are battling and fighting addictions and fighting with complicated things in their life and, and they're walking through the hog lot. No, oh God, they need to come to themselves, but they'll never reveal darkness until the light shines upon them. And when the light comes, darkness is revealed. Father God, move across this audience here this morning. If you're sitting in this audience and we're praying for you right now and praying with you right now, that if you feel a need to get up from behind your seat and to come to this place of prayer, there's a good Samaritan waiting for you. The world wants to beat you down. The world wants to rob you of your potentials. The world wants to take away from you those things which you have and those things you've worked for and those things you've tried to accomplish. The world wants to defeat you and take that away. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And I've come to give you life more abundantly. I'm an innkeeper this morning. I'm keeping the inn. I'm keeping the lights on. Would you please get up this morning from behind your seat and would you come as we're praying right now in the name of Jesus. Would you come and kneel in the presence of God and say, God, I need you more than I've ever needed you before. This morning is my day. I've got to have help. And my help comes from the Lord. Oh, come on, mama. Satanariosa. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, may the glory of your Shekinah hover around this building. And may we feel the power and the glory of your name. God, right now in the name of Jesus, right now in the name of Jesus, Deliver us from our iniquities. Set us free from our bondages. Give us hope and eternal life. Only you are able to give. I know there's people in this building this morning that you need to be here. And I don't know why that you're sitting back. I don't know why. I don't understand. But you need to be here praying. You need to be making a new commitment, a new dedication. God, give me the first love that I had when I first knew you. Let me feel that same dedication, that same surrenderance. Let me feel that same desire to work for you and to turn it all over to you. Oh God, by your power, by your glory, right now, Jesus. Is there anybody else in this building who wants to come? I'm going to ask you all to get up from your seat and come to this front and find somebody that you can get behind here and begin to pray and begin to just talk to God. God, 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 awaken, awaken, awaken something inside of all of us. <coughs> I hunger for you. Come on, let's come. Oh God.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Almighty oh, God, how I love you, how I need you. I hunger for your presence, oh God. Awaken within us, God. <laughs> 